All right, good morning, everyone. On behalf of AgriLinks, MicroLinks, and the USAID Office of US Foreign Disaster Assistance, I would like to welcome you to our seminar webinar titled Helping Smallholders Make the Most of Maize Through Loans and Storage Technology, Evidence from Tanzania. My name is Julie McCarty, and I'm a Knowledge Management Specialist with the USAID Bureau for Food Security, and I am the host of AgriLinks events. So if you ever have questions about the AgriLinks web platform or our event series, uh, you are welcome to come to me. We're excited to welcome researchers from Purdue to discuss strategies to address the dual issues of credit and post-harvest loss among smallholder farmers focusing on Tanzania. Uh, but before we get started with the content, uh, first I'd like to pass it to my colleague from Microlinks for a special announcement. Thanks, Julie. I'm Kristen Oplanik from uh, the Bureau for Economic Growth, Education, and Environment. And I'm really excited that in March, we are going to be relaunching the Microlinks website, rebranded as Market Links. So better reflecting the content. And uh, it sounds like somebody's vacuuming. Uh, <laughs> better reflecting the content that we've we've had for the last few years, but um, really staying focused on economic growth topics and market development, um, having a name that that better fits who we have been. So you'll probably be seeing communications about that, and um, you'll be able to continue following us on marketlinks.org. Great, we're all excited for that, and for further integration uh, with AgriLinks and MicroLinks. All right, so just a few quick reminders. Uh, for those of you in the room, please silence your cell phones so that we don't interrupt the speakers. Uh, we ask that you hold your questions until after the presentations when we'll be passing around a microphone for you to speak into. Uh, we have a webinar audience as well, so we'll be passing for some questions back uh, for our webinar audience. That's also part of why we ask you to use mics so that they can hear your questions. Uh, and this event is being recorded, and so by virtue of coming here today, in about a week and a half, you'll get an email with the recording, a transcript, um, audio transcripts, and a few other additional event resources. So keep your eyes open for that email. All right, we're ready to dive into the content, so I'm going to introduce our three speakers, and then we can get rolling. So first up will be Julie March, who will be providing an introduction to the topic. And she is the team leader for food security and livelihoods with the USAID Office of US Foreign Disaster Assistance. And then next up will be Jake Ricker Gilbert, who is an associate professor in the Department of Agricultural Economics at Purdue University. And he has worked in a variety of capacities to support sustainable, oops, sorry, I forgot to uh, move it to, there's Julie March, <laughs> and there. And here's Jacob. Um, he has worked in a variety of capacities to support sustainable intensification and also to measure cost effectiveness of input subsidies in sub-Saharan Africa among smallholder farmers. And then we'll also have Hira Chana, who is a doctoral student and a graduate research assistant in the Agricultural Economics Department at Purdue. And her dissertation focuses on strategies to solve post-harvest challenges for smallholders in sub-Saharan Africa. So we're very excited to have them speak to us today, and I'll pass it to uh, Julie March to start. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm so pleased to be here today to welcome our colleagues from Purdue, Jake and Hira. And I believe online we have Diodone Baributsa, who is instrumental in the work that we do as well. He'll be on the chat for those of you online. Hopefully I got that right? Yeah. OK. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I really would like to emphasize how the work of Purdue has helped change and model the types of agricultural interventions we do in emergency and disaster response. And it's been a collaboration for us for almost a decade now. Um, I know for many other teams and offices within USAID, that relationship has gone even longer, and I'm sure also been very fruitful. Um, the journey for AFTA into post-harvest loss really grew out of a friction point for us. We repeatedly had people proposing things like seed banks and grain banks in areas of active conflict. And if you think about a context like South Sudan, northern Nigeria right now, um, the idea of bringing farmers together to calmly sort and store their seeds with repeated, I see head shaking in the back, with repeated displacement and um, other types of chronic issues like repeated droughts, it just wasn't a good setup for us. Um, 
I'm not saying it can't work for other contexts, but in the emergency and disaster response arena, it wasn't appropriate. So we couldn't just say no, we had to think of an alternative. And we started looking into post-harvest storage loss reduction and improved handling and storage practices. Um, Globally, I think when you look at disaster responses, the number of responses are increasing every year, and they are not quick in and out responses, right? You don't go into South Sudan and expect to have it all wrapped up in six months to a year. Um, and so we're looking at these complex responses which last a long time. Think about Nigeria, Chad, Mali, South Sudan. Um, and the types of interventions that were being proposed weren't really appropriate or really sustainable for that context. Um, surely with decades of response experience, we could come up with something better than handing out seeds and tools every year and moving on. Um, so we started thinking about how do we build potential for greater food security and ultimately for farmers' ability to make choices, right, in terms of the types of crops that they choose and ultimately their storage behavior. Because it's all about providing choice, not dictating what method we're going to use or making people use a particular technology. I'm, I get really excited talking about post-harvest loss. I can literally count on one hand and maybe one finger the number of effective and low-cost interventions that we have available to us through emergency ag programming globally. And that one finger belongs to post-harvest loss activities. Um, you know, for something like a 2 to $5 investment, we can reduce post-harvest loss up to 50%, maybe beyond. I'm sure they'll give us more specifics. Um, it's really been a game changer in terms of contributing to increased food security, contributing to increased seed security at the household level for vulnerable farmers. And I think that ultimately that's our game and our goal in humanitarian response is to help build a path towards agricultural development um, globally. Purdue has been really instrumental in providing proof of concept. They've developed a system for local uptake through their marketing of pick sacks. Um, and I think their model has been successfully integrated by NGOs all over the world, and mostly with their technical support and collaboration. Um, I think a really interesting thing about this model is that its utility spans emergency response all the way through development programming. And I know that within USAID, we're often looking for areas where we can work together, where um, emergency feeds into development. And we don't find too many of those. So this also is a bright spot for um, post-harvest storage. So I don't want to take up any more time. I just want to say I'm very much looking forward to this presentation. Um, I think it's going to add one more element to solving the puzzle about why farmers do what they do and how we can help them do that, especially in contexts which are um, chronically stressful, like drought or um, conflict. So um, thank you, and I will hand it over. Thank you, Julie, very much for the invitation. We really appreciate it. And thank you all for coming and listening to us discuss some what we think are exciting findings about this project. And I'll give a little bit of an overview of what we're doing on post-harvest in general and then talk more specifically about what we found in this project. So just to start, when we think about the challenges associated with increasing staple crop production and productivity in Africa, they're, they're large challenges, and we all know that. But post-harvest challenges should not be ignored. And when we define the whole post-harvest period, it's really the period between when the crop is mature and then when it enters people's mouths, people consume it. We're mostly focused on the drying and storage side and the activities that we're, we're doing on this project and mainly on the storage side. But just to define post-harvest, it's that whole period. And there, there are many, many challenges. And the two that we focus on in this project are right here. The first one, we could call it an opportunity and a, a challenge, is the price seasonality that we often exhibit, that we often see exhibited in places, especially those that have one harvest per year, such as the site that we're, we're focused on in Baya in the southern highlands of Tanzania in this project. And this is just showing the price seasonality uh, for the past couple years. 
And you see the difference in price that bottoms out at harvest in June and continues to rise throughout the year and into the next year when it peaks around January and February. Hey, so Jacob, this I'm creates... sorry to interrupt, but um, is it possible that you can uh, try to speak into the microphone yeah. as much as possible? Sure. Yeah, I can sure. Like, or, or, yeah, maybe or I can use, use the hand microphone. Mic. Since yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Is this better in the back? OK, great. So this presents a ch an opportunity and a challenge if you can get your grain from here to here. But there are many threats to that opportunity. One of them being, as we see in the other picture, the, the natural threats, the insects and the mold that can damage your crop and make it difficult to be able to take advantage of that price seasonality and make money through price arbitrage through storage. The insects and the mold, those, those challenges, uh, create quantity loss where you physically lose grain and they also create quality loss in the sense that you the food may become unsafe if it's infected with mold um, if it doesn't look good it's going to get a lower price at market so you're going to lose quality and value there the main solution that's on the market for people the majority of people deal with insect pests through using chemical insecticide a popular brand is Actelic that you have to apply over the course of the year two times um, and you're putting chemicals on your food supply um, which isn't ideal the the issues of price seasonality as I said it creates this potential for arbitrage if you can store and keep your grain until the lean season but as I'm sure everybody knows many farmers are credit constrained at harvest and need to sell immediately at that low price uh, to pay back inputs when you're when you're making decisions at planting time you have to buy seed and fertilizer you need money uh, and you may need a loan to be able to carry you through the season until you harvest four or five months later and, and have your product that's harvested and you can sell it and pay back your loans. Also many times, uh, many times school fees come due at harvest and there are other expenses that people need to pay. So they need cash at harvest and they have to sell at that low price even if that means they have to buy back later in the year at a high price. And this is sometimes called the sell low buy high phenomenon although we understand it you know being in big part due to this credit constraint that people face so when we talk about post harvest loss and how big it is there's studies including those by FAO that cite 30 to 50 percent post harvest loss which is huge and I think it's important to note that first some of those studies are citing the entire post harvest chain as I said between the time when the crops mature to when it's consumed and they're also citing it if people do nothing and I think it's important to re remember that people do do things to mitigate these losses um, from some of the background work that we've done on the PIX3 project where we asked people their self-reported quantity lost over quantity stored and this again is just storage loss not total post harvest loss we get in the neighborhood of about 4% to 7% loss. In Tanzania, where we're focused in this project, uh, from our other surveys, we get a close to 7% uh, storage loss, I should say. So it's not as high, obviously, as 30 to 50. And again, it's the result of some adaptation strategies that people are taking to deal with the constraints and the problems that they face. Um, just like people adapt to climate change, they adapt to reducing post-harvest loss. And what we see is that the main adaptation strategies, given these constraints that people face, is to use chemicals like Actelic. In Tanzania, we can see that over 50% of people in our survey were using chemicals on their maize. Uh, Ethiopia, it's even higher at about 77%. The other thing that they do is uh, not store as long as they might. Uh, we see in Tanzania that uh, people, um, especially for sale, don't store more on average they store about 22 weeks for consumption it's about 35 weeks and of course there's a range some people store longer they can make it the whole year some people store much less um, also the same thing with post harvest loss some people lose a lot some people just lose very little so there's quite a range of distribution but we see these these decisions that people make as a result of the problems they're facing and given this situation there's no doubt that we can do things to help them improve and store longer, store better quality 
uh, grain, and we're focusing on maize here in this study. So when we at, when we look at these two questions about you know the need for credit, the need for cash at harvest versus insect problems, uh, we did it in our surveys in Uganda. Um, we asked people the question, why don't you sell? You know, why don't you store longer? What's the reason you sell at harvest for a low price rather than selling? And the top two reasons were either uh, you need cash to pay expenses because of the credit constraint or insects damaging maize. So we're going to do like a little audience participation. Since I'm a college professor, I like to get people involved. So who thinks it's the credit problem, the need for cash, that's the number one reason they sell early? OK, so maybe two thirds. Who thinks it's insects? couple people who doesn't know so by far people say it's the need for cash right that they, they need, need to pay their expenses they need to pay their bills they need to pay school fees um, and insects avoiding insect damage and mold is is a distant second but it's still there and it doesn't mean that insects and post-harvest loss and and these natural challenges are, are not a problem they're they're probably the second problem to this um, but they're they're a big challenge too but but at the forefront of people's mind when they sell early is this credit crunch that they feel. Other, other answers that came in, you know, they're to a less extent are things like, I don't have storage capacity, I don't, I don't store maize, et cetera. Uh, I don't think prices are going to rise, that kind of thing. But these are the two biggest, and definitely the need to earn cash is a big one. So we talked about, you know, how people are dealing with this. The credit crunch, they sell at harvest to get money, even though they're not getting as much money as they might if they stored later in the year. Potentially, if they have off-farm income, they can use money from, from that other activity to pay their expenses and store their maize um, until prices rise. But that's assuming that they have that option, which many people, of course, don't. Uh, to deal with the insect problem, we talked about using insecticides like Ectelic which are not ideal from a food safety standpoint and an effectiveness standpoint. Another thing that we see, and we've seen evidence of this quite a bit in our surveys, is that people really have this belief, and it's, it's quite true that local varieties store better. So the flint varieties, the local varieties that are common in southern and eastern Africa have a, a tougher kernel, and they're, they have uh, closed husks, so they're more resistant to insects than the higher yielding dent varieties that have softer kernels and open husks and are easier for insects attack, to attack. And this belief is firmly held locally. Therefore, there's this trade-off that people have to decide. You know, do I grow a higher yielding hybrid that doesn't store as well, or do I grow a lower yielding um, local variety that stores better? And, and to some extent, this post-harvest challenge could be limiting hybrid adoption and have sort of knock-on negative effects towards production in the next year. Other things that people do is uh, use, they store on cobs in these local structures called vahinge uh, in the region where we're operating. And it's believed that if you store on the cob, it's tougher for insects to get at than if you store shelled uh, maize. They also do things like dry on the roof or hang maize along the wall to try to keep it away from the insects. So that's, that's sort of what, what's happening, you know, at the present time, uh, or has been happening for a long time to deal with these problems. But what we're trying to do is at least test and look at some solutions or potential solutions and, and options to help relieve these constraints of credit and insects uh, and help, and through that, help increase consumption, income, and ultimately resiliency among smallholders by sol hoping to reduce the insect problem through getting people to move from using ectelic, using these chemicals to kill insects, and putting maize, shelled maize, in these sort of generic bags that you see for sale that don't offer any insect protection and, and last about a year, to an improved bag, which I'll talk about here in a second, that protects maize or any grain uh, without the need for insecticides and lasts two to three years. And on the credit side, we provide a loan to smallholders. Um, we work through credit groups, and you can see this is a village savings group and their, their, their log books and their uh, safety box where they keep their documents and their information. We provide a loan to smallholders, and we'll talk about this in detail here in a second, where they can take a loan against the present value at harvest of their maize 
store it safely in these bags for six months, use the cash from the loan to pay their expenses, and then have that maize safely stored for six months until prices rise. They pay it back with interest, as here we'll talk about, and then they make money. The idea is that they make money on the, the seasonality and the arbitrage and have good quality maize. So just a little bit about the technology. We're trying to help them move from a traditional storage structure like this one with the thatched roof that offers little to no insect protection, especially if you put it in you know, a bag and a, a traditional bag like we saw on the previous slide. After some period of time, you'll have this unattractive looking maze that's insect damage and probably has mold on it. Um, we want them to move to this improved storage structure. And uh, it's called the PIX bag, the Purdue Improved Crop Storage Bag. I brought one uh, to show you. This is a baby version, 25 kgs. The one that we gave people in the project, uh, and the more common one is 100 kgs. But this different size provides some flexibility because it's less burdensome uh, to carry 25 kg sack than a 100 kg sack, which weighs a lot. Um, so the way it works is these bags, uh, these PIX bags were developed by Purdue entomologists in the 1980s and 90s. And you, put your, you make sure your maize or whatever grain you're storing is dried to a safe level um, so that mold can't grow. And you, you, you have these two layers, these two layers of high density polyethylene that you, you put the maize in the inner layer, you close the first layer, tie it tight so there's no air in it, tie the second layer, and then tie the third layer so that it looks like this. It creates an airtight or hermetic seal around the grain and insects can't breathe so they basically suffocate. And after some period of time, we, we looked at this maze from Ethiopia after about six months and it looks really nice. If you compare it to the maze up above, We'd all much rather eat the maize from the pix bag than the non-pix bag. Um, so these pix bags, and, and Julie talked about this for a little bit, of, are being promoted uh, in large part. They're, they're part of a number of other projects. But in large part, it's being promoted uh, in the third phase of the pix project, pix 3, with funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We're based in West Lafayette, Indiana, and we're promoting the bag in seven countries right now as part of the project that you can see on the map. And the idea is to bring the supply side and the demand side together. On the supply side, we're developing local manufacturing. So we have a manufacturer in each of the seven countries that's building these bags locally. It, it builds local support for the product and provides employment at factories for people to build these bags. And then from there, from the manufacturer, we work to develop distributors and distributor networks who then have a vendor network at the local level who sell directly to farmers. So that's the supply side. At the same time, we work to build the demand side by creating awareness among smallholders about the bags through doing village level extension demonstrations. We use mass media and ICT, cell phone videos, radio broadcasts. We do some films in villages where people hear advertisements in the middle of a local film about the PIX bags. And then we rely on word of mouth, people who've learned about it, to share with their friends and neighbors and relatives. The PIX project really started in 2007 with funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and has ramped up quite a bit uh, till now. Some of the initial purchases were made by the government of Niger, who bought a bunch of bags, and the project bunch bought a bunch of bags. It, it started in West Africa with cowpea, and we've moved on to other crops. But you can see the growth in number of picks bags sold has been really, really good, in a, especially in a percentage term. We've had a lot of good annual growth. This year, we've sold almost 4 million bags worldwide, which is great. It's helped a lot of people. Um, but of course, when you think about all the bags that people use around the world. And there's many more opportunities for people to benefit from this. So, so of course, the bags are an important part of this project, in addition to the loans. But when we think about what we're actually trying to measure in this project and our theory of change and how we're going to you know, alleviate some constraints for people and hopefully make them better off, help them become better off, we assume that people are constrained by insect damage and mold in the post-harvest and that they're constrained by lack of credit to meet their expenditure needs. 
So the two treatments or the things we're going to give them are first we're going to give people the two PIX bags that holds up to 200 kgs of shelled maize. And the other treatment is the two PIX bags plus the equivalent value of that maize at harvest. So it's about $40 that people will uh, use to, to pay their bills in store. We hope to see with the PIX treatment, it, uh, insect damage reduced, mold neutralized. Again, if, if you have grain that's in an airtight environment, mold can't grow because there's no air. Um, and we also relieve the credit constraint when we add in the harvest credit. And we hope to see, of course, ultimately more grain stored at harvest, harvest uh, for sale or consumption later in the year. As I mentioned, we want to see if, if this, credit can, if this uh, insect constraint is relieved, do we see more hybrid seed adoption and hopefully more adoption of fertilizer to have some benefits and create resiliency further on. And if PIX bags, we believe them to be a substitute for storage chemicals, hopefully they'll purchase fewer uh, chemicals to protect their maize. And then ultimately, we want to see increased income and consumption and better health. And we want to compare the incremental benefit to those things by you know, including the PIX bag and then adding credit onto that. So here is going to talk specifically about the project and the intervention. So let me hand it over to you, Hira. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you to everyone who's listening in, and thank you for the opportunity. Oh, OK, is this better? <laughs> uh, so I'm going to be talking more about the specifics of the intervention. So just a quick look at the area that we're covering. This is uh, Southern Highlands, Tanzania. We're specifically in the Bear region uh, right here. And we covered around seven districts in this region. Uh, our team consists of a lot of great people from different institutions and different disciplines. Uh, there's us at Purdue University. Uh, we have a project manager who's based in Tanzania. Uh, we have the local NGO, Filetaggio, who we're working with, uh, who are like a mother-daughter team. And I'll be talking more about them in the next slide. Uh, and then we have IITA, who is responsible for the data collection for the baseline and then the end line, which we'll be going back for in May, uh, this May. Uh, so our credit partner was Filetaggio. They're a local NGO. Like I said, they're like a mother-daughter team. Um, so their main responsibility is to help uh, these credit groups or Vicobas, uh, you know, to register with the local government. Uh, if the government comes with any intervention, uh, you know, Filetaggio helps facilitate it. Um, they got like special permission from the district government to be a part of this project, you know, because it involved lending out money. Uh, so these credit groups, uh, they consist of like 15 to 30 people. Uh, they meet every week or every other week. Um, and they buy shares, which is kind of like savings for them. This creates a pool of money uh, that is sometimes lent out to other members. Uh, if the group is really large, they also invest it in other businesses. Uh, just something to note here is that these groups are really heterogeneous across the board. And for a lot of these groups, despite the fact that they are a member of these groups, they are still credit constrained. And a lot of them don't have access to external sources of credit. And the specific loan product that we're talking about here is still new for these uh, group members. Uh, so you know the advantages of working through these savings groups for uh, loan interventions, they're, they're well documented. Um, uh, you know, our partner, Filotajo, is familiar with these members. Uh, there is a sort of group guarantee. And they have like this established network of employees, which makes the logistics much easier. The timeline of the project is, uh, so we started off with the baseline survey in May 2017. The actual intervention with the bag and the loan was in June 2017. Uh, the loan repayment uh, was scheduled to begin and end in December 2017. Uh, there have been some challenges with the repayment. It's still ongoing. And we'll be talking more about what those were specifically in the upcoming slides. Um, the end line survey is scheduled to happen in May 2018. Uh, what is ongoing also is a journal collection. And I, you know, we'll be talking more about that in the next couple of slides, what exactly I mean by that, too. Uh, so who are we talking about here? We had around 1589 farmers, 131 credit groups. And like I said, this was spread out across seven districts in the Bay region in Tanzania. Um, so this is just like how we allocated people. Uh, so the randomization was done at two levels. The first one was at the group level and then at the individual level. 
So with projects like these to like cleanly pick up the impact of this intervention, you know, the PICS intervention or the PICS plus credit intervention, that's why you need to randomize who gets what. So initially we start off with 131, oh, sorry, 131 groups. Uh, 44 groups are control, another 86 are in the treatment arm. The treatment arm is split into two. We have 44 picks. Uh, we have 44 picks, and then we have 43, 43 picks plus credit groups. Uh, we had another layer of randomization after this, which was at the individual level. So the main reason for doing that was because financially it was not really possible to give everyone who was in the group uh, the you know the loan or the bag. Uh, but that one was done, you know, it was, we tried to make it as transparent as possible. It was essentially like a bowl with slips of paper that was passed around. So, you know, everyone knew what was happening and why, you know, you got selected or you didn't. So we ended up with two groups of people here. So you have the exposed group and the treated group. So the exposed group is kind of like they were trained in the use of the bag, um, but they did not actually receive anything from the project at, at this time. And it's the same in the PIX plus credit. Like, they were trained in the use of the bag, but they didn't receive the bag or the loan at this time. Uh, the PIX bag intervention consisted of a training in the use of the bag. Uh, the training does involve like a discussion of the benefits of the bag and why it's better health-wise and economics-wise uh, as compared to traditional storage methods. Uh, the actual intervention involved the dispersal of two bags uh, in June when you went back, and uh, like the total bags that were dispersed as part of this intervention was 850. Uh, the PICS bag plus credit intervention, it also starts off with a training in the use of the bag. Um, the actual intervention involves the dispersal of the bag and a loan, which is approximately uh, worth $40. And the loan is like it due, was due back in six months with a 12% interest rate. Uh, one of the requirements of Filotaggio, our partner, was that the grain, because the grain that's stored in the pigs bag, it was like collateral for the loan, that it should be stored in a collective place, and it was with, with some few, you know, with some exceptions. Uh, as part of this, we had 626 bags that were distributed, and Filotaggio lent out around $14,800. Uh, so the journal collection, because you know these groups meet every week or every other week, as I said. So everyone who was surveyed, including the control, treatment, and exposed, they were given these journals, and it basically, um, you know, they fill out maize and legume transactions, you know, sale, purchase, consumption uh, data every week. And you know, the the advantage of doing this is, first of all, like statistically, it's really nice to have like more observations per person. But also because uh, you know, hopefully this is better than relying on recall when we go back, like you know, in May 2018, which is like after a year. Uh, there have been some challenges with the journal because you know the area that we've covered is is very spread out. Um, so, but what you know, what we've done to compensate for that challenge is the team that's based in Tanzania. Uh, you know, they're constantly calling and in touch with people to fill out the, this information. And then when we go back in the end line, we'll be sure to collect all of these journals if we haven't been able to do so so far. Um, so I'll just now be looking at like initial findings from the baseline survey that was held in May 2017. Um, uh, so we have like an almost equal number of men and women. We have slightly more women. Um, this is kind of like expected maybe from credit groups for you know to see more women. But just to note that like in these groups though, you know like if it's whether it's the husband or wife who comes to the meeting, generally the decisions you know they involve money, so people do make them together. Um, this is so the blue bar is the average uh, May stored for each of these categories, and this is approximately 1,500 uh, kg across all of these categories. Uh, this is slightly, you know, they're larger maize producers as compared to the average Tanzanian farmer. Uh, the orange bar is the maize stored. Um, so the thing with this maize stored, though, is that this even counts in maize that you must, you know, you know, that you've stored for like a few weeks. But if you look at the data, like, you know, a lot of farmers within four or five weeks, this becomes really spread out because, you know, like one third of our sample does not have any maize at that point, and and some do. Uh, this is like the average uh, revenue for each of these categories, um, and like sorry, these bars are like the standard deviation, and you know, with revenue you expect this kind of variation. Uh, and another note uh, is that these are like jointly balanced across these categories, which is important when you're doing uh, randomization. 
Uh, so just a quick look at the uptake of each of these interventions. So for the PICS intervention, you know, which was like the dispersal of the bags, almost everyone took up uh, the bags. For the credit one, it was 80%, which is all, which is still pretty good because it shows that people are interested in the loan product. Uh, people were free to refuse, um, and this is actually one of the reasons why you know we did this survey and you know the selection of people in May, and then we gave people a few weeks to think about it when we went for the actual intervention in June. And but still, you know, and but we are still serving all of these people, and you know, we'll follow them, follow up with them if you know if they still want to be a part of the the project. Uh, in December, you know, we were, we tried to you know like I went back and we tried to get a sense of what people actually did with the loan. So it's really interesting. Around 40% basically used the loan as an opportunity to become maize traders, and they bought more maize for um, sale later on in the year. Another 20%, they had problems with their own harvest. You know, either they lost their entire harvest or it was really small, and they needed to buy maize to store in the pig's bag. Another 25% used it for household expenses. A lot of this is actually payment of school fees, like Jake said, which you know is due around that time. Uh, another eight percent used it to cover harvest-related expenses, you know, like paying labor, and another seven percent used it for investment, you know, either in small businesses or, uh, in some cases, livestock purchases. So I think I'll give it back to Jake, who will talk more about the challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Hira. One of the challenges we experienced in this uh, project was that we saw the graph uh, in the initial slide or the second slide that showed about an 80% price increase the past couple years, but we actually saw a minimal rise initially in this season, uh, which was in contrast to what we'd seen. And when we went back, I went in October to see what was going on, and Hira went in December, as she said, we found that the people were saying that because prices had been favorably high the past couple of years, people decided to plant more maize this year. So what we would say in economics is there was a supply response, and people were trying to, you know, looking at past prices to try to you know, plant more and maybe make more money this year. We also learned that the government, the new government in Tanzania, had put on an export ban on maize so that it couldn't leave the country. Most of the maize in the southern highland, first it goes to Dar es Salaam, the capital, but it also gets exported to Democratic Republic of Congo and even to Kenya and sometimes into northern Malawi and into Malawi, uh, depending on the year. But because of this export ban, uh, maize wasn't leaving. They didn't. The government didn't want to follow a previous pattern of having people sell maize at harvest and then waiting until the government released stocks in January, February, March um, to buy buy back. They, they didn't want to do that, so they put this export ban on so people would keep their maize. Um, and also neighboring Zambia had a bumper harvest. And as a result, as you see in this picture, there's a lot of there was a lot of maize around. So that required us to be flexible. Uh, Firitajo, our, our lending partner, our NGO, I should make clear, this: the money that was lent to farmers was Firitajo's money. It wasn't USAID money. It wasn't Purdue money. It was the local partner's money. So they had to you know, make it work for them, and that's an important part of this. Uh, they were willing to delay the re loan repayment. We had originally planned for everything to be paid back the end of December, end of 2017, but they were flexible with the groups and uh, they allowed it to be delayed, and they make, made arrangements with people. Last time we talked to them, which was on Saturday, they said 75% of the money had been repaid, and they'd made arrangements uh, to get repayment uh, in the coming weeks. The, the export ban was lifted in November, so prices have risen slowly. Um, but we're confident that we'll get uh, pretty close to full repayment. The impact is, of course, if prices don't rise that much this year or as much as they have in the past, the benefits obviously of the loan won't be as high, but we'll see what happens. When we talk about what we've learned, and, and I think we've definitely learned a lot so far, um, for the, the technology part of this, people seem to be quite happy with the PIX bags when they learn about it, um, and they learned about the benefits of the bag that 
you know, you have to pay a little bit more upfront than you do with a traditional bag. The Pix bag, let's say if you translate into US dollars, costs $2, 250 for a 100 kg bag. If you, you know, buy a traditional bag, it costs maybe 25 cents or 50 cents. But if you have to apply chemicals twice a year and you have to pay labor to apply chemicals, after a year or so, the Pix bag makes a lot of economic sense and you can use the Pix bags for two to three years, and then you don't have to use chemicals on your, your maize. So once people understood those benefits, they liked it, they wanted to buy more. Evidence suggests that people who were in that exposed groups who learned about it were interested in buying more that didn't get the bags. And even people who got the bags were interested in buying more. Some of the credit groups actually saw it as an opportunity to start selling bags to become vendors, even distributors, and, and make a business out of the bags. Um, because they saw potential for growth. Another interesting thing is that combining these PIX bags with credit seems to have reduced the risk for the, the lenders Firitajo. They liked the fact that the loan that the grain, the, the maize that was part that was the collateral for the loan was stored in this safe location. So they knew that if they had to, you know, if somebody defaulted, they could get this high quality maize back and they would have something physically there to collateralize the loan. So that was good. Uh, it's clear in those results that Hira showed you that a lot of people saw this loan as a business opportunity and they took it as an opportunity to buy maize and potentially take advantage of the arbitrage which they were expecting through that price seasonality, which again, it didn't happen as much as we thought or they thought. But one thing that's kind of interesting is this challenge that we're, we have to lend through groups because obviously you're not going to lend to people on the street, just random people. You need to lend through these groups for repayment. Any bank or any NGO is going to want to do that. But these people are, are part of credit groups, so they may not be the most credit constrained people in Tanzania, for example. But they're still credit constrained, but they're, you know, they're, they're part of these groups. But for the, the purpose of repayment, that's kind of the way you need to go, rather than just you know, lending to people that you aren't necessarily credit worthy, who may be in greater need. Um, the challenges with the lack of the price rise highlight the general challenge with agricultural credit that there's a lot of things outside our control that affect loan profitability, weather, planting decisions, government policies, et cetera. Looking forward and looking back at what we've seen so far, it probably makes sense to expand these loans, shift it away from maize or, or try expanding it into other crops like rice and legumes. Um, rice and legumes are higher value than maize, and especially legumes have tremendous post-harvest loss potentially happening to them. So they, they make a lot of sense. Um, and the government, at least in Africa, is less involved in legumes and rice than it is in maize. So you may not have these export ban problems. Um, the, the flexibility in the loan repayment dates was important, and that really helped because Firataj of the NGO had an existing relationship with this group, these groups, so they knew the people and were willing to be a bit flexible. And another thing that we saw was because all the loan couldn't, the loan repayment couldn't happen at once, and and Firataj of the NGO had to go back or continue to follow up with these people. And it's the rainy season in Tanzania right now, and many of these groups are inaccessible. The fact that there was a mobile money option lowered the transport costs and the transaction costs, and, and people were able to be to, were able to pay back Firitajo using mobile money, which really helped make it more profitable for the lender. So the next steps, the, as here mentioned, the journal collection's ongoing right now. We're going to go back in May for an end line. With the data, the surveys, and the journals, we're going to be able to ultimately answer those questions about the impacts on consumption, sales, purchases, input use like fertilizer and hybrid seed uh, planting, et cetera. Then we've received some funding from AVDA to expand the project in Malawi this coming year. Uh, it'll be nice because we can compare the outcomes of this PICS and PICS plus credit with a neighboring country. And based on what we learned in Tanzania and also the wishes of the bank that's going to do the lending, we're going to focus on legumes, uh, ground nuts, and soybeans rather than maize, you know, in large part because of the way the government in Malawi is involved with maize. Um, and we want to do some more focus trying to understand the labor impacts of moving from pesticide application on maize to storing in PIX bags. If you're, you know, you don't have to, you know, wash maize, apply pesticides, 
you know, rewash it multiple times. There could be some important savings and some important health benefits. So in Malawi, we're going to do the baseline and intervention starting next month, and then we'll do an end line in 2019. So it'll basically be starting this year and ending next year. So thank you. I've got some takeaway points. Uh, so if you if you forget everything else about this presentation, I want you to remember these seven points. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, but uh, the first one is you know just this this issue that people really seem to like this technology once they learn about it. And even though we gave them two bags, the the people who are selected, there's still demand for it. Uh, we saw this in Uganda too, where we gave people one or two bags. When you give them just a little bit of a subsidy for a new product, it creates awareness and stimulates interest. So we expect to see more purchases by these groups uh, in the future. Of course, you don't want to give people all the bags they could ever want, but a little bit of a subsidy for a new product reduces risk and can, can spark interest and build, help build the market. Uh, the second point is, I made it already, just that having this uh, technology to collateralize the loan and protect the grain that was part of the loan made a big difference for the lender, the local partners, the flexibility between the groups and the local partner that was lending the money was very important. And with agricultural credit, we were you know, dealing with a lot of uh, things outside our control that affected the profitability of the loan, like weather and government policies. It was also really interesting to see how people use this as a business opportunity, 40% of people bought more maize um, to try to sell later in the year. And we had to work through groups for repayment. But part of the challenge is, again, if you compare them to people at random, and these people are probably le a bit less needy, but still needy, but they're more credit worthy. Um, and of course, a, a lender, the thing they're worried about is repayment. Um, and mobile money really provided a lot of flexibility for loan repayment and is an important tool moving forward, I think, in this kind of product. So thank you, and we're happy to answer any questions or comments. Thank you. Um, and if you'd like to keep those lessons and takeaways handy, the slides uh, should be available on AgriLinks um, right after this seminar. So I see we've got some hands in the room. We also have some people online. I wanted to quickly pass it off to someone I tapped for a first response, uh, Ahmed Kablan with the USAID Bureau for Food Security. And then we'll move along to some additional questions in the room. So I'll pass it over to Ahmed first. Uh, thank you, Julie. And uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for the presenter for sharing with us their finding and uh, thank you uh, for Okta for organizing this meeting and for funding this work. Um, I mean, as you know, uh, post-harvest loss is a critical part for our food security ourselves. By 2050, we are expect or it's expected that we need to increase food supply or ag productivity by about 48.6 percent. Food post-harvest losses and food waste contribute as much as more than 30 to 50, about 50 percent in the highest estimate. Even with the lowest estimate, it is a food produced, not being consumed, and that could be utilized to improve our food security in the future. Um, the uh, food, both harvest losses and food waste uh, uh, are critical also for, in terms of uh, where we work in poverty and food security and nutritional outcomes because food loss is food not being used to be sold in the market and to generate income is not food consumed so affecting food security but also the nutrition, uh, nutritional outcomes because especially in the lean seasons and not to forget post harvest losses they are not on the quantity being lost but also on the quality of the nutrient being lost in the food, especially when we are moving toward more high-value crops, perishable crops that are also rich in nutrients. So improper storage and handling of the food contribute to lower in the quality. And as Jacob mentioned, the food safety angle for it to application of highly toxic pesticides or insecticides in order to stop an insect infestation, that also represents a food safety risk. And not to forget, um, these crops or application of this highly toxic insecticide does not stop fungal growth. And in maize and groundnuts and other mycotoxins, aflatoxin is a higher risk. So storage in improper or improper storage, such as the jute bags, that's commonly used cheap bags, as Jake mentioned, 
uh, those also they do not they don't really stop the growth of mycotoxin. After stop uh, research, uh, research from the post harvest loss innovation lab, the food processing innovation lab at Purdue University, they showed the efficacy of the PEX bags in reducing or preventing the growth of uh, fungal growth because it creates a hermetic environment inside the bags. So that is another advantage of the PEX bags and the importance of applying credit to enable farmers to. Uh, purchase these bags and use them. Um, the the other things I mean, linking this work will be critical with other research investment that we have at USA funded by USAID, including the post harvest loss uh, reduction innovation lab at Kansas State University, including the food processing uh, uh, and post harvest loss reduction at Purdue University. I think. You are linked with uh, Professor Betty Beguso at Purdue, including some of the work that have been funded with our uh, from BFS also on Aflastop by the Meridian Institute, where they looked at the story, different storage uh, uh, methodology and the efficacy to reduce mycotoxins. The MIT site uh, work that funded by the Global Development Lab and several other works, and I really did not know if they have funded or are funding some work related also that contribute, as Julie mentioned, to food security and emergency because and the resilience work that link to the reduction of post harvest losses. Um, again, it is a great work and I don't want to take too much time. I see a lot of excited people who want to ask questions. And as I have the mic, I'm going to ask the first question. <laughs> On the figure that you showed about the loan utilization, uh, uh, Mira, um, you showed well, there is one group, about 25% who use it for household expenses, which is the second biggest group that used it. So did you check the uh, amount, if there was more food stored when they are using this, the money to pay for schools, for other expenses, did, which means did, did that trigger less urgency to sell the crops and they stored it for a later period of time, hoping to get more money and more sale? And if, of course, if that did not, the, uh, the ban on export was not placed, maybe they could have achieved that if that was the case. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your comments and the question. So um, just for like a clarification before I answer, um, we will be going back for an N-line survey in May, and we'll be able to get more specific answers to your questions. But like, you know, from when I was there and from like anecdotal evidence, yes, it absolutely means that you do have more maize to store for yourself. And, you know, yeah, it just, does that clarify or? Is it <laughs> but yeah, hopefully we'll get more specific answers when we go back in May. Thank you. And also, let me Oh, it's on good. No, I'd be happy. So we're definitely involved in, uh, on the, the drying uh, side of this with the, the food processing lab at Purdue. I'm, I'm involved with that. And, and that's an important component. And I'd be happy to hear more about, you know, some of the related activities that are that are going on that USAID is involved with. Up front. All right, so I'll pass to you. And if you wouldn't, or if you don't mind, let us know um, who you are. Hi, my name is Bill Scott. I'm with Dexas Consulting Group. Um, I was very curious to know what was the reaction of the banks, who have a lot of money to extend credit, and also the trader community in these picks bags. I mean, this is sort of a sea change for them. They've got less food loss in the system. How can you work with them, and, and what did they say? Thank you. That that was a great question. We've seen uh, so in Tanzania, we um, we worked with this local NGO that 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 seemed to be that's a bit more flexible than a, a larger bank. They actually borrow from uh, Opportunity Bank. Yeah, and uh, and uh, you know so that so they distribute credit from to the to the groups through through that bank as as part of this. Um, so the local NGO is is has been pretty flexible in 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 offering this loan in Malawi. We're working with a a more formal bank, uh, F first discount house house bank. They're willing to to do it. 
Um, and they have probably tighter safeguards in place to get their money back, um, but maybe they're a little bit less flexible. So I think that that banks are realizing that there's an opportunity here, that these groups are a potential market. And hopefully this project can show that it, it makes sense and it's you know worth some of the risks that are out there, um, that these people can be credit worthy if they're part of groups. I think, again, one of the things with Malawi and and the one the desire to focus on legumes was they they saw it as more high value the people that grow legumes probably are a little bit more commercial oriented and and they expect you know that they'll be able to get their money back and then traders so w one thing that that just anecdotally we've seen if you're just uh you know buying maize to sell it quickly the picks bag probably isn't for you. It's not a trading bag. It's a storage. It's a granary essentially. It's a storage structure. Um, so, but the people who are are growing or buying to store, it makes sense. Um, that's sort of the market for this. I'd like to send it back to our online audience before we come back to the in person. Oh. Yeah, so we've got um, over 100 participants dialing in today from South America to Sub-Saharan Africa with lots of questions. And we also had um, Yodone, who I think was um, from Purdue as well, who was um, helping answer a lot of these online, but um, still have some lingering questions here. There were a few questions around um, some um, other things that could potentially penetrate the bags, like large borers and rodents, wanting to know if um, the bags were resistant to that or if that was an issue. Um, well, Judene can maybe respond in the chat uh, if I say something wrong, because I'm, you know, an economist. Uh, but but uh, the the picks bags, if from what we what we, the entomological research has shown is that if you have larger grain bore on the inside of the bag, um, they 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 suffocate too. They can't get through the double layer. So it does it is effective against the larger grain bore, which is an which is a very aggressive pest. What you need to do. Uh, to prevent insects from the outside coming in and rodents as well is the recommendation is to store it on a, a wooden platform that's a little bit elevated off the floor and make sure your place where you're storing is clean so that you don't have loose maize kernels lying around that will attract rodents so they start sniffing around but what we've seen is that if it's a clean area and you store picks bags with other picks bags and not next to a non-hermetic bag that rodents and, and the, the insects can attack, it will keep away rodents and will prevent insects from coming in from the outside. Um, so that's an important part of the training as well. We did some follow-up, for example, in Uganda, and it's where we'd, we'd done the training and then we went back. And we saw that most people, we looked at how they were storing and where they were storing, and most people got the message and you know were storing it in a safe, clean location and didn't report really any, too much rodent problem. More questions from our in-person audience? I think there was one over here. Yes. I'm Tamara Duggleby, and I'm one of the evaluators for the Innovation Lab uh, projects, which have been implemented in Africa and, and four other regions, aiming at reducing risk for farmers and increasing their yearly surplus and, and investment. And I wanted to know what was the, the chief mechanism for working with people in groups. I know you had them organize these savings groups. but And they were in the same communities, obviously. But were, were there any other contacts, any links between them? Were any of them part of producer groups? Does that work? Sorry. Um, so these groups, they were already existing by when we went in, uh, you know, because Filatajo had already been working with it. Like the average length of this, these groups is like three years. Their primary purpose is um, to like to promote savings within the group and then to create like this pool of money that, you know, anyone who needs it can then borrow from. 
um some of them do also do producer activities but actually you know like in some of them there are concurrent groups that focus on like production for example these groups primarily they are like savings and yeah exactly you know they're linked through communities through families and 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 things like that but yeah again we did not bring these groups together and that's one of the reasons why we worked with philajajo like you know they had these groups established and you know they'd been there for a while so thank you another question from our online audience sure um we had a number of questions around sustainability. What um, what will happen when the project is over, and um, what was designed um, as an exit plan here? Thank you for that question, and here can add on this as well. We're working uh, in Tanzania with the NGO Firitajo to. Um, you know, understand some of the more of the challenges and their interest in doing this again. And and Hira talked with them when she was there in December, and I talked a bit in October. They say they're interested in doing this again, which is great. Um, they may shift the focus a bit and find you know the the groups that were the easiest to work with to to lend to. I don't know you know how they're exactly going to do it but they say they're interested in doing it one thing they may do is there was some some people said we wish we got a bigger loan so forty dollars wasn't enough they may make it a little bit bigger um to the people that they choose to work with and um they also actually felt inspired to offer for different groups uh not the people that were part of this they offered uh input loans to people so they did actually expand their product offering this this season for people so hopefully we had some impact in you know encouraging them to to try some new things but we are we are working with them to uh expand it and our project manager bernadette is uh you know very um innovative and assertive and she's looking for some other potential lenders who might be interested in these findings and and interested in doing this uh, yeah no absolutely i think everything that jake said i think you know like the pix bag like Filatajo, they really believe in the bag and you know it's true like you know they've seen it it keeps the maze safe so you know like it really like it's they see it as good collateral and you know like when i talk to them they're really excited about it one of the things also you know like like jake mentioned in malawi they are also like you know depending on what area they're in of expanding like the pro you know the loan to like different products like legumes specifically so yeah great uh, we've got about 20 minutes left for questions, so we'll keep going with an in-person question. I'm Mark Mitchell with Land O'Lakes. I didn't hear you mention any of the cost associated with the transport and storage of the collateral grains. Who who ate that cost? When and what happened if you had any storage of an accidental loss, like the the storage shed burned down? Um. So, like, as far as storing the grain, that was borne by the groups themselves. You know, the most of them they brought it together in like a central location, which was nearby where their farm their farms were. Um, we had one incident specifically uh, where you know there was a problem with the batch of the bags, unfortunately, and there was a loss. So that involved negotiating with the um, you know the filetajo, the lending. That was one instance. Uh, another instance was, and you know, that's when I say when like, you know, people, the Philadelphia really likes this technology because it keeps the maze safe. So in one case, uh, there was, you know, the groups did not want to repay the loan. There was an issue with the price. In that case, they basically got somebody to come and buy the grain. Um, and that was essentially at cost. So they didn't make any money off it, but there was no loss associated with that either. So I don't know if you want to add. <laughs> All right, I'll shuttle it over here. Thanks, everyone, for the great presentation, Patrick Starr, USAID. Um, this is sort of a half-baked question, but I'm wondering if there's, um, if you've studied any minimum necessary percentage, maybe, price swing between harvest and um, the peak sale price to understand, you know, what kind of crops may be best suited for this model. Um, especially given the price fluctuations that may not be quite as pronounced for other maybe commodity crops and 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 so forth. So, uh, and then especially when you layer on um, the interest rates that are um, that are applied to loans and and different enabling environments that 
um, maybe in Malawi might be a little bit different than in Tanzania, uh, could could make this maybe a, a, a non-sustainable model. But just so that's my question. <laughs> Very good question. Uh, we certainly did uh, analyses of break even with maize. I, we generally, at least I generally think of maize first as the food security crop, and that's the one we should, that's going to have the biggest impact on what we should target. So that was the mentality going into this. Um, but again, as you said, and as we said, you know, legumes, the, 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 profit, of, the profit potential may be much higher. Um, Based on our scenarios and what Furitaja was lending at 12% and uh, the, the price seasonality that we'd seen, we, we assumed that there would be profit. And there may still be profit, it just may not be as big as, um, as, we've, as we've seen. I think you know, that's, it's probably worth maybe something that comes out of this kind of a, 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 a sort of a simple sort of playbook analysis of where the break even sort of given these this interest rate and the potential price fluctuation you know what kind of pl price fluctuation do you need to to break even and make this profitable i think that's a a good recommendation for something to to come out that others could use in the future all right um let's send it back to our online audience if there's another question and then we'll come back to this table um, sure. There are some questions about the details around the loans themselves, if the loan was fixed at um, 40 USD or like what the loan to value ratio was. Um, also questions around the use of mobile money for loan disbursements and um, what, um, how that worked, what the challenges were potentially and plans for the future. Uh, so for this intervention specifically, the loan was fixed at 40 US dollars. And like, as Jake mentioned, though, you know, like, and like I also said, like these groups are really heterogeneous. So, you know, hopefully if Philadelphia goes back, there's probably going to be a lot more variation uh, in, you know, the amount of the loan and who they give it to. Uh, so the mobile money, so in December, uh, we actually physically went to these locations to talk to as many of these groups as possible. But you know, like right now it's the rainy season, for example. So places are, some places are just inaccessible to go to. So that's when something like mobile money you know, it's it's really nice because, you know, you can communicate on the phone and, you know, they've seen the face, they know like Philadelphia is taking it seriously. So then it's like, it's a much more low cost and easier way to get people to, to pay back. And it allows for greater flexibility, you know, because people have now, because of this price issue, some groups have been paying in pieces, you know, okay, we'll pay half and then we'll pay, you know, we'll pay the rest of it later and things like that. So mold money is really great there. Hi, my name is Ethia with Agra International, and uh, my question is about the pigs' bags and the drying or moisture content of the grains. So what I've observed is that in countries where they have two or more um, agricultural seasons in a year, you would realize that they would have a shorter period that the crops can remain on the farm to dry because the raining season will kick in very soon. And so they have to harvest and dry using other means. And if they don't have the appropriate drying equipment to use, then the quality of the greens are actually affected from the drying stage, even before it moves into the pig's bags. So did you have this challenge? What was the agricultural calendar or planting season in Tanzania like? And if you did, how did you go about it? Thank you. Uh, so this area that we're working in specifically, it is uh, unimodal. There's just one season. So like right now in December, the planting starts and the harvest approximately be begins in May and, and June. And I think Jake will talk more about And And of course, I, I mentioned briefly, the under, uh, talking about drying is a big part of the training because you want the grain to be dried, of course, before it goes in the picks bag. Um, if there's mold or if there's any sort of fungi growth and it's dried below 13%, it uh, you know it won't propagate any further in the airtight environment if the bag's closed properly, which is important. Um, if it's too wet and it goes in the bag, it may ferment. Um, 
you know, because you have this anaerobic environment. But but dr there's no question that drying is a big problem. And in the 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 our food processing and post harvest handling innovation lab, along with the post harvest loss innovation lab, and a number of other projects are, are trying to figure out the drying problem and how do you, you know, cost effectively dry grain quickly. And it's a big challenge. Uh, you know, for most people, they're not at a scale that it makes sense to buy a dryer. Um, how do you get a dryer that's, that people are willing to pay for? Uh, what we've seen in our work in Senegal and, and some work in Kenya on this issue is for a lot of people, um, you know, the, the most cost effective way to, to dry is just to have a tarp or the roof or someplace clean to get it off the ground prevent fungi contamination and and try to dry it in the sun as quick as possible and get it in a good storage structure. We uh somebody we had a, a colleague at Purdue that that came up with a low cost moisture detection device that's about two dollars um that, that you can use to tell if you put maize in a bag, it's called a hygrometer. If you put maize in a bag it for 15 minutes it'll equilibrate and give you a reading to tell you if it's below that 13 percent level to uh, that you can safely store. So it's it's a low cost innovation, and 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 we're trying to disseminate that as well. But there's no question, drying is a is a big issue. Thank you. Ver can you hear me? Yeah. Um, my name is Jose Maciel with Fentrack. Uh, thank you very much for a very comprehensive uh, uh, presentation. Um, and I wonder if you could discuss a little bit about the different levels of uptake on the bags and then on the use of credit available. Uh, specifically, uh, the bags apparently was were at 100% uptake, uh, but credit not so much. Um, was this an issue of the size of the credit or is it the terms for repayment? And and I understand you're, you're discussing this moving forward also in Tanzania. So if you could discuss a little bit about that. Um, thank you for your question. Yeah, so the loan uptake was around 80%. And so from what I understand from your question, it's essentially like why those 20% like did not want the loan. Yeah, there's like a variety of reasons. So some of them I know were trying to negotiate like a lower interest rate with the credit group. And when that didn't work out, they were like, you know, we don't want it. In a couple of cases, they felt like they did not need the credit and they would have liked a larger loan and that this was too small. Um, yeah, those were some of the reasons, I think, for... On the PICS adoption, uh, yes, in this intervention, since it was a new product, we did offer 100% subsidy, so it was a free bag for people, um, so they, they were willing to try it. What we've seen, and I, I mentioned this at the end, is in uh, the places where we followed up on that, where we, say, randomly gave people a bag, those people were actually more likely to go out and buy a bag commercially than the people who'd just been trained and hadn't received one. So again, it's like this idea of a new product. You're providing a free sample, essentially, and then you're stimulating the market. What we've also seen just in terms of adoption numbers is, for example, in Uganda, where we we uh, baseline surveyed in 2014 and nobody had used the bag basically in the sample or heard of it. And then we did our awareness building, our demonstrations, our extension activities, and then went back two seasons later. Adoption was at about 6% um, in, the, in the places where there'd been training. So, you know, in terms of... Uh, you know, we of course we'd love to see it higher, but in terms of just a one calendar year, two season adoption rate, it's it's pretty good if you think about how long it's taken for some agricultural technologies like hybrid seeds, for example, to get adopted. We've seen in Kenya after about two or three years, hermetic storage in Western Kenya, where we did some sampling, is about seven percent of people have one bag. In Nigeria, where it's been around for about ten years, we did some follow up surveys last year and adoption. Is, is pretty high, about 15, 20%. So it, it's making an impact. Um, but of course, like all innovations, it takes some time. Um, I'll, I'll send it back to our online audience, but we'll get to you next. Um, so one more from our online. Sure. Um, we had a question around um, integrating potentially a warehouse receipt type facility, and if that was something you consider doing or any thoughts on that um, to link the financial institution to a collective storage facility to for the bad grain? 
yeah, that's a good idea, and it's it's certainly come up. Um, one of the things w that we've when we've looked at like warehouse receipts, uh, it, it's hard, you know, for the small holder to access those um, in the sense that you know they don't have that much to store. They've got to take it to some location that could be some distance away, and then you know they're losing control of their food supply. So one of the things people like about those picks bags is that it's your food in your bag and you can store it in your house um, away from you know people who you know may want to ask you for some of it or could steal it so you can keep it you can keep your food supply safe um, and that's a nice thing of the bags compared to the metal silos for the so for the small holder you know the population that we're kind of working with and that would be in the interested in the picks bag i mean i think there is some potential but it may not the warehouse receipt system may not be the primary storage vehicle for them i think what has been good in this project with the especially with the loans is this idea of this group storage place so with people you trust you put your maze in a safe place like the treasure of the group's house or in a community place where you you know some kind of central location where you have a locked door and people of course keep their own maze with their their own name on the bag so we know it's this person's maze but you know it's stored collectively as collateral that may be more you know, accessible to the the, the, the smallholder population. Yeah, no, just that it's, I think for the sample that we're working with, like logistics and cost wise, it, it is really difficult to go to, because, you know, Tanzania does have a structure like this, but none of the people in our sample were involved with that. And that's a good thing with of working with Filatajo because they knew these people. So it was stored in like a central location, you know, like Jake said, either at the treasurer's office or in like a local government office. So it's visible to them and then it's visible to everyone whose grain it is. So, you know. Hi there. Um, my name is Dan McMahon and I'm with FinTrack. Uh, we've worked a lot with PixBags in our Partnering for Innovation program and uh, the CAVES project in Kenya. Um, Jacob, I had a question for you about uh, the harvest day loans that you were talking about at the beginning, um, which seem to differ from the $40 um, type product that uh, you were mentioning later on. Um, have you run the numbers on how margins are affected for farmers um, when they do take out that harvest day loan? Um, in a more typical year, um, one that sees more price, price fluctuation throughout the, throughout the harvest, um, months after harvest. Have you run the numbers on how margins are affected and how much farmers can see um, an increase in their margins when you account for the, the repayment of the loan and the uh, interest? So, I, 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 so let me clarify. I mean, the idea of this loan was that it's a, a harvest loan that they got at harvest, at or right around harvest, that they could use to pay expenses and then store. Is that, are you thinking of a different type of loan? I mean, that's the idea where you borrow against the present value of your grain at harvest, which 200 kgs was about $40 in this region. Um, so, we, you know, we figured if, if the, on an average year, so $40, you're paying 12%, you know, that's, let's say, what, $5 or something. And then you can, you know, the price will almost double. You can certainly make, you know, thirty-five, let's say thirty, thirty dollars or something in profit, thirty, forty dollars in profit uh, on that. So it should work in a typical, in a typical year, even with, you know, with five dollars interest or something to that extent. You should be able to, to make it happen. And again, we may, I think we'll see profit for, you know, a number of people, but it just may not be that high. Um, Uh, we'll take one in the far back. Hi, I'm Shaylee Adenolfi with Thank You. We're a blockchain as a service company. Um, and we're exploring similar kind of use cases in various countries. Can you um, tell me what kind of technology that NGO was using, the bank was using to kind of monitor all of what was happening um, and kind of whether you think it would have made a difference in reducing the the interest rates. Thank you for your question. 
So there are a couple of things. So the primary way of monitoring is like through reports from their network of employees in each district. So, you know, the way they're, they're structured is they have their head office in Bay City, which is the main city in Bay region. And then they have like one coordinator in each one of these districts. And then depending on how big the district is, the coordinator has like one or two people who work under him or her. The what they did was it was because of this project and other projects was that each of these coordinators had smartphones and, you know, sporadically. So other than checking up with the coordinators on the phone, they would send them pictures of when the grain was stored, whether there were any issues and things like that. That was primarily how they monitored. And I think, you know, a part of it is, is that they knew these people well. The groups are also well aware that, you know, they will work with Filatajo on other projects. So, you know, there's like benefit and incentive on both sides to keep like a good working relationship. And that's what they relied on primarily. Thank you. All right, I think we have time for one last in-person question. And I'm wondering if there's one from someone who hasn't asked one yet. No? Well, all right, I will send one over to Kristen. Kristen Oplanik, USAID. Um, I was just thinking about this, um, the credit constraint issue and, as you're saying, the risk in terms of agricultural credit. Um, and I know we've seen success in some of our other activities where they've paired loans with insurance products. And I was wondering if that's something that you had considered. Uh, obviously, the availability of the insurance product is the first issue. But um, just in terms of consideration, especially vis-a-vis um, -vis Patrick's question with kind of what the price floor would need to be for all of this to work. And if you could have an insurance product against that price floor, that could be a very interesting solution. Um, not an easy one, I'm sure. But just something, if it had that, any consideration there. So that's an interesting question. So you're saying basically a, a sort of an insurance on the price, like a revenue type insurance, not an index weather insurance. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's really an interesting question. Uh, if if people would go for that, uh, or if they'll just take their chances, uh, it would be. I mean, it would be interesting to see what the uptake of that would be. I, and I think that that's really interesting, combined with the loan and and the picks bags. If if you know, we could look at that. It wasn't something that we considered. Uh, we had our hands full implementing what we had, but it's a great point. And yeah, for future research, it's a great idea. All right. Well, I um, I like to try and wrap up our seminars right on time, and we're, we're nearing our 11 o'clock end time. Um, but I encourage anyone who couldn't finish asking a question to make connections with the presenters, to type them in online. Um, or to let me or the AgriLinks team know, we'll probably provide some follow-up on further questions uh, in a post-event email that all of you will receive. And so um, I just wanted to let you know that there is no market links, no longer micro links, uh, seminar in March. And we're still trying to solidify our AgriLinks seminar for March. Um, but there are actually many links websites at USAID. And there's one called Land Links that you may or may not be aware of. And they're having um, a follow-on to the Microlinks joint seminar from October that will discuss lessons from public-private partnerships for a responsible land-based investment in Mozambique. So it's a lot of interesting knowledge sharing seminars uh, stemming from USAID knowledge management websites. So um, check out landlinks.org if land tenure is uh, in your wheelhouse. And so uh, lastly, be sure, of course, to come check out the PIX bag um, if you're interested in seeing it in person. And we'll see you hopefully at future AgriLinks and MarketLinks events. So thank you very much for attending. <laughs>